Hello, lovely fully charged viewers, and welcome to another episode of Fully Charged News. Now, some of you around the world may not be aware of this, but it has been extraordinarily windy in the British Isles in the last uh, couple of weeks. We've had two storms, both with names. The first one was Storm Kiara, the second one was Storm Dennis. Anyway, it was very windy. We've had a lot of damage. We've had a lot of flooding, enormous amounts of rain uh, in a very mild winter. It has been pretty messy. But one thing that happened was, <laughs> which isn't surprising really, we broke all previous wind-powered energy records that have ever been set. The Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, that is the IEEFA, no, I hadn't heard of them before either, but they've reported that Britain set a new daily record for wind energy, topping 44%, so over 44% of the country's electricity consumption over many days. That is extraordinary. This was greater the nuclear and gas combined for that period. So what this is saying to us is that one thing, when it's very windy, we're going to produce an enormous amount of electricity. Uh, as time goes on, because we're going to be putting in so many more uh, um, wind turbines, both onshore and offshore, the one thing we need to be able to do with that is store it for a later use, because there's no way we can use it. So what happens at times like that, when there's a really enormous amount of wind, is the Wholesale energy price goes down and down and down because, oh, because wind energy is cheaper. And it drives the price down, the wholesale energy price, not what you pay in your house, but the wholesale energy price, and it can go negative. And it's gone negative about four or five times in the last couple of weeks. And some people who are not on new payment plans with new energy companies get paid, listen to this, consumers, they get paid to use electricity. So they get paid a certain, it's not a lot, I'm going to make a fortune, a certain amount per kilowatt hour to use that electricity to, to create a demand so that the grid can use that power. That is, I think, a sign of things to come. The UK has 13.57 gigawatts of onshore wind installed, but that includes Scotland. Not, a huge majority of it is in Scotland, let's be honest. The, the, we've had a lot of planning restraints with the current administration and previous administrations about land-based wind turbines in the south of the Scottish border. They've got gazillions up there. And we've had to put in new cables to take that power down into the rest of the UK. Because we can't take... We, there's so much power coming from Scotland now, particularly when there's 44% of it, of, the, of our total consumption, a big chunk of it is coming from Scotland. Um, anyway, so we have 13.57 gigawatts onshore and 8.5 four gigawatts offshore. Here's another important thing that I'm always, I'm thinking about more and more because I'm going through some more changes in my house and I want to show them to you later this year. But electricity, as I'm experiencing firsthand, all the lights that are running this, the computer that's recording this, everything is running off the batteries in my garage, which were charged by the solar on my roof in February in the United Kingdom. It was quite a sunny day today. That is easy, that is relatively easy to deal with power. Heating is still a problem. Heating is the elephant in the room, as uh, people say in corporate circles. If we had an elephant in the room, because it generates a lot of body heat, it would actually warm the room. If I had an elephant the other side of this room, I don't think it would be a happy elephant. It would feel a little bit claustrophobic, but you know, it would certainly warm the room. So how do we heat things without burning stuff? Because that is the kind of key driving force behind fully charged, is can we stop burning as much stuff as we're burning now because burning stuff is generally not a good idea well in the Apennine Mountains in Tuscany which is in Italy so sort of northern and central Italy uh, a geothermal well has been drilled that goes down nearly two miles deep imagine how the technology can be developed I'm here now and I've got an engine really powerful engine thing and it's turning a rod that's all it's doing and the rod goes out the window it's turning the rod and it keeps twisting that rod. It's not in rock or anything, it's just going sideways. It's got supports with bearings on it. It's two miles long. And that, at the other end, that is turning. That is what you're doing when you're drilling two miles deep. Mind-boggling. I know it's been, it's been going on for years because that's how we drill for oil. But they've been drilling two miles deep, not for oil, not for gas, but for heat that is naturally there. And what they're looking for is supercritical geothermal fluids. Oh! Doctor, 
I've got some supercritical geothermal fluids. I think I need to take my pills. You would not want supercritical geothermal fluids in your pants because they are at temperatures that are mind numbing. They're temperatures that can bend rock. So they're very, very hot. And they're, so what they're trying to do, it's taken me a while to understand. I had to read quite a lot of papers. Here's the Earth's crust. That's where we stand. Then it goes down two miles down. Here is the crust between the really hot, molten, unspeakably hot ball at the centre of our planet. Gets slightly cooler as it reaches there. And then there's a, there is a, um, a cusp between molten rock and solid rock. And that is what creates our magnetic field. That's, that's, all that stuff is spinning around there. It's totally weird. And maybe one day we'll get a geologist, geologist on to explain how there's a massive spinning ball of molten material in the centre of the planet we live on that we just think of as benign, quiet and gentle and loving. It's terrifying what's down there. Which obviously when it leaks up and it has a bad bit of acne, that's a volcano and it spurts out all kinds of stuff. Dangerous. So when they're drilling in the Apennine, which is an area known for earthquakes and volcanoes, obviously in historically, you're, 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 you're dicing with death. But what they're doing is they're extracting the heat from that, turning that, using a heat, uh, a heat exchange, they're turning that into steam so that you pump usually a brine or a special fluid down two miles. It comes back up incredibly hot. You, you transfer the heat from that to water. That turns the water into steam. That drives a steam turbine, which turns a generator, which generates electricity. Uh, for, forever, 24 hours a day, forever, no fuel needed, no burning needed. That's the point. So what the, the, the search for these fluids would mean that you could run a massive power station because you've got the kind of heat that you would get in a nuclear reactor. Uh, and that's why they're looking for super critical geothermal liquids. But there's not that many places. There's somewhere in Iceland they found it. There's somewhere in, uh, I think, Yellowstone National Park, probably in China. There's dots. It's dotted around the world, but it isn't common. But what they discovered is once you d drill down that deep, you're reaching high temperatures anyway, high enough to run uh, electricity generating systems economically. Now, this cusp between the molten bit and the solid bit is called the K horizon. I love that. Sir, we're approaching the K horizon. Heat shields up. They, they, sent, they put sensors, obviously, on the drilling equipment. They've got to see how hot it is. And they were telling them it was 537 degrees centigrade and 300 times greater pressure than on the surface. It's just an unimaginable amount of heat and pressure down there. That is definitely enough to boil a kettle. There is a drawback, and I would imagine there's actually, we're going to come to another story soon where there may be two drawbacks. But the one drawback, obviously, which is what's happening with fracking, particularly in this country, is it can cause just the odd earthquake. That's, there's always a drawback. Because, you know, you're getting constant, fuel-free, 24-hour a day, 365 day a year, amazing amount of electricity from drilling a hole down into the ground. You might just cause a little earthquake It's not as bad as fracking because, it, because in fracking you drill that hole then you pump stuff in at phenomenal pressures to smash the rock up oh and now there's an earthquake kel surprise moving on from that but connected to it uh while we're on the subject of drilling um natural gas which we are told constantly is much cleaner than coal yes it is and uh, a bridging uh, technology to get us from uh, burning fossil fuels to renewables. Very important that we hang on to natural gas. Using the word natural is obviously very useful because it sounds more benign. Natural cotton. Natural gas. Uh, uh, the extraction of natural gas, particularly using fracking, has been shown recently to be incredibly bad for the environment. Massive methane leaks at the drilling wells. Now, they will deny this until they are literally puking and green in the face because they're breathing in so much methane at the top of their wells. They will deny it. But it is happening. It's been proved to happen. It's been published in numerous papers. It's been referred to in the, in the publication Nature. Now, so geological, natural geological occurrences like volcanoes, like, I love those, bubbling mud pits. You, you know, you see, must have seen film them, even if you haven't seen them. Boom, 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 boom. Just a big sort of mud puddle with bubbles coming out. That is methane bubbling out the ground. In uh, northern Alaska and northern Russia, where the permafrost is melting, vast amounts of methane escaping into the atmosphere. Methane is the worst 
uh, global warming gas that we can possibly do. Forget CO2, that's quite benign. Methane is really bad. There's a lot of it. Oh, cows is the other one. It's not farts, it's burps with cows, just so you know. So recent research has shown that those naturally occurring events make up a far lesser proportion of the total amount of methane that is escaping into the atmosphere on a daily basis around the world. The vast majority is coming from uh, gas extraction and from badly managed gas extraction. So the two sides of this, obviously that is very, very bad. The bad bit is gas wells leak, oil wells leak. It happens with oil as well. It's not just gas. Oil wells leak. Loads of methane escapes into the atmosphere all the time, regardless of what the fossil fuel industry say. But the good side of it is like this. That there's one way, this is an area, so like if you've got gas coming out of a, a, you know, a volcano, there's nothing we can do about it. If you've got gas coming out of an oil well or a gas well, there is something we can do about it. We can stop drilling for oil and gas and then we'll stop releasing that methane. So that it is controllable by human decisions. There are areas we can make a decision and we can stop this incredible damaging escape of all this gas. That's the good side. Will we do it? I think it's extremely doubtful that it'll happen overnight, but it will happen. It will happen. We will stop extracting fossil fuels and burning them pointlessly in rubbishy old machines. That's going to happen. And as we are seeing, the alternatives to generating power, for instance, by burning stuff are much cheaper. They last much longer. They're much easier to maintain. They don't need to be taken offline for so long. Coal and gas plants have to be turned off and refitted for months, sometimes years, we don't hear about that. We hear about the one day a wind turbine isn't turning. We really need to shift the focus away from wind and onto the traditional power uh, system, which is incredibly inefficient, incredibly expensive, and keeps us trapped in fuel poverty. But batteries are a key component in this, and Tesla have just started to do some negotiations there's, these are brilliant rumours, but they're rumours by really clever journalists, and I've really had to read a lot to try and understand this story. But they're basically aiming to reach a point where they have cobalt-free batteries. Cobalt is the, they're really the curse of the battery industry. It's also incredibly expensive, over $35,000 a tonne to buy cobalt. Most of it is used in phones still to this day, and uh, small portable electronics, and petrol uh, refining. It removes sulphur from petrol. They use it in the refinery process. Nowhere near as much. I did say that it's more. No, it's nowhere near as much as is used in batteries, but it's still a lot. And that won't change. They're not finding a way of removing sulphur from fossil fuels without using cobalt. There's no such thing as cobalt-free petrol. But we might not need lots more cobalt to make batteries. There's a company in China called Contemporary Amperex Technology Co. Limited, Cattle. Uh, and they're in talks with Tesla. To, uh, to develop uh, lithium iron phosphate LFP batteries for Tesla cars. Now, people are already making LFP batteries. This is nothing new. Uh, static storage often uses LFP. It's, it's bigger, it's less energy dense, and therefore something that doesn't mind about being a bit bigger and a bit heavier, it doesn't matter. They last longer and they're much, much cheaper to manufacture and they have no cobalt. Now, EV manufacturers, pretty much all of them, use nickel cobalt aluminium, NCA, or nickel manganese cobalt, NMC batteries. But they have much higher energy density, meaning you can get more electricity into a smaller, lighter unit. And here's the figures, and I'm going to read these out to make sure I really get them right, because these are really important. So LFP batteries, the ones with no cobalt, currently store between 90 and 120 watt-hours per kilogram of weight. You take a kilogram weight of, of LFP batteries and you've got about 90 to 120 watt hours in there and that so that's less than a kilowatt hour isn't it quite a lot less the uh, Tesla's NMC 2170 cells which are made by Panasonic which is what are in their cars now what's in my model 3 the other side of that wall they contain they can store somewhere around 247 watt hours per kilogram much much more so more than double the energy density but however it's a lot to do with the way the batteries are packed and the cells are packed and they're working on boosting energy density of lfp no cobalt batteries and rumors are that they're approaching 200 watt hours per kilogram so an enormous improvement basically doubling the energy density 
Uh, and I just want to keep saying this is battery technology that contains zero cobalt. The cobalt argument is about to be kicked out, this, out the room. But I, what I think the point I really want to make, well, the reason I wanted to cover this story is because it really underlines the fact that battery technology is not static. You look at a battery today and it's very different from a battery from three years ago and incredibly different from a battery from 10 years ago. One of the big differences is the cost. The cost has dropped dramatically over $1,200 per kilowatt hour to make a battery in uh, 2010 and it's now about $140 a kilowatt hour to make a battery. So, so this is very not a car based episode of news. There's no cars in it at all. <laughs> There's a lot of wind turbines and a lot of batteries and a bit of gas. Uh, but we're making so many episodes about cars. I was Because there's lots of news about cars. And I was thinking, oh, shall I do car news? And I thought, well, there's no real need. because so we're going to go and see lots of cars. We're testing lots of cars. We've got some really multi-car-in-one-show projects coming up, which I'm very excited about. But there's so many being... And vans. Vans and buses. Ooh, we're so excited about the stuff we're going to go and see this year. Very excited. So we will do our best to cover them all in the coming year. But before we do that, I just want to round up this episode by saying a big, big thank you and a, and a reassurance to our wonderful Patreon supporters that we are going to get it together on Patreon. We've been a bit slack. Some of the episodes haven't appeared on Patreon very quickly, like they're like five days late. Because And so we're, going, we're working out a new system. But I just want to thank these few people for their incredibly generous support. They, they donate over $10 a month or more. To, uh, to fully charge. It's absolutely brilliant. So here they are. A big thank you, please, to Roman Schaller, Peter Viner Brown, Eleanor Chalmers, Thor Olson, Stephen Mintrom, Mike Winter, Simon Bell, Tom Brown, John Chivers, Anders Nyquist, David Hunt, Mike Maschin, Danielle DiCarlo, Mike Ward, Mike McClelland, Richard Durham, Robert James Riley Murphy, Alan Rees, Andy Sylvester, and Nigel Wagg. Thank you so much for supporting us. We really appreciate it. We will try hard. We're always trying harder. We're trying to catch up. We're getting there. We are really getting there now. Things are really improving this year. I'm really excited about what we're going to be doing. There's going to be some brilliant new presenters we've just been talking to. Uh, we're going to do some great projects with them, which is great fun. Uh, that's all though so please do you know do the subscribe thing on the old YouTube or click the belly thing bing 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 up in the top right hand corner uh, have a look at the little patreon link that is beneath this video and um, that's it as always if you have been thank you for watching